welcome everyone to this uh, post-lunch slump session, which is going to lift you out of that, of that post-lunch feeling. It's going to be good. Um, on Cultural Studies Matters. The idea for this session germinated when, over the period of a few months, I heard three different scholars discuss the need for more engagement with the cultural studies tradition in really quick succession. Um, Rivka Jaffa, in the Sociological Review annual lecture last year, talked about the need for urban studies to engage more closely with cultural studies. And then I heard um, Onamik Saha, um, often hear Onamik Saha, talk about the need for studies of race and ethnicity to engage properly with uh, cultural studies and the, the field of the cultural. And then I heard uh, Ben Carrington at the BSA conference talk about his frustrations with American sociology and their lack of engagement with cultural studies there. Um, I have a friend who works in fashion who says that when you spot something three times, that means it's a trend. So I was quite interested in that, like what's going on here? Why is there this need at this current moment to re-engage with that cultural studies tradition? What can cultural studies contribute to our understanding of the sociological? Where is this legacy alive? What, if anything, can we, do we need to recover from that tradition of, of thought? So I'm really glad to bring together uh, two of the people that I just mentioned in that introduction in, um, to d discuss these issues. So we have two speakers today. They're each going to offer an intervention of about 20 minutes, possibly 25. Um, first up, we have Ben Carrington, who's an associate professor of sociology and journalism in the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of of Southern California. He studies a broad range of topics concerned with mapping the circulation and reproduction of power within post-colonial societies, but specifically he's interested in how ideologies of race shape and are shaped by cultural forms. His books include Race, Sport and Politics, The Sporting Black Diaspora, and the edited collections on race, sport and British society, and one on Marxism, cultural studies and sport. He's also produced some really great podcasts recently on Stuart Hall, a figure who I'm sure will be central to our discussions later on. Our second speaker is Onamik Saha, who's a lecturer in media and communications at Goldsmiths. His research interests are in race and media, and he's particularly focused on cultural production and the cultural industries. I'm really pleased to say that his excellent book, Race and the Cultural Industries, um, which came out earlier this year, I think, yeah, um, is making quite a splash at the moment and seems to be invigorating some of these discussions around race and the cultural industry. So very excited about this session, and I'll welcome our first speaker, Professor Ben Carrington. Um, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is the microphone on? Good, great, thank you. Um, buy this book. <laughs> First announcement. Um, I'm honoured to be speaking to you today. I'd like to thank uh, Emma and Jenny and the rest of the organisers for putting on this wonderful event. And um, like I say, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honour and a privilege to be speaking to you today. Um, I'm going to go straight to the talks that I keep to my 25 minutes that have been allotted, 20 to 25. So I want to begin my presentation by referencing what I thought was an interesting observation that Bev Skeggs made uh, during yesterday's opening roundtable discussion. Bev, in talking about the type of work submitted in recent years to the Sociological Review, highlighted what she called, quote, the turn towards cultural studies. As someone who's worked in the United States for well over a decade, first in the sociology department at the University of Texas at Austin for 13 years, and now at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. My comments are based on that experience and my read of the status of cultural studies in the US. In that light, I was struck by Bev's suggestion that a certain type of sociological work informed by cultural studies is resurgent within sociology in the UK, or at least as measured in submissions to the journal. As examples, Bev mentioned the work of Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy and Les Back has been particularly influential. And perhaps in the, the, the discussion and Q&A, we can get into the details of this and whether or not the sociological review is representative of what is happening in the, in, within UK sociology. By contrast, I want to suggest that there has been a rigorous, sustained, 
a largely successful attempt in the US to not just resist the impact of cultural studies on the work done within sociology departments, but to malign, marginalize, and ultimately ignore that work altogether. Given the constraints of time, my remaining 22 and a half minutes, I will forgo the more detailed explanation of this argument and instead make my key points by way of selective illustration of the state of play within US sociology. A situation that currently involves a retreat backwards to the worst forms of reductive thinking and the closing of the sociological mind. US sociology is slowly dying from the deadening hand of neo-Parsonian hyper-conceptualization on the one hand and unreflexive positivism on the other, strangely enabled by Bourdieu influenced anti-cultural studies scholars seemingly committed to a sociology fixated on boundary making and divorced from any serious engagement with real world politics. Dead methods producing a dead sociology, as Les Back and Norma Pua might put it. So, two examples. I also do children's parties as well, if you're interested. <laughs> First, in 2014, the renowned historical and comparative sociologist Orlando Patterson published an article entitled Making Sense of Culture in the Annual Review of Sociology. For those unfamiliar with the journal, the Annual Review of Sociology is, as the name suggests, published once a year and contains review essays on key topics that are of interest to the wider sociological community. A distinguished board of sociologists meets each year and decides which topics are worthy of being written about and which leading figures can provide not just a critical summary of their specialist area, but can also highlight significant new discoveries or emerging trends. Given the potential breadth of sociological areas, most topics are redone only every decade. Such is the standing of these review articles that, when well written, key ARS articles are often become one of the most cited in their field and sometimes help to reshape and reorientate the field itself. In other words, they matter. Remarkably, in the state-of-the-art overview on the key insights of sociology into and about culture, Orlando Patterson decided not to engage the extensive au revoir of Stuart Hall and further steadfastly refused to even acknowledge the contributions of culture studies scholars to the study of culture. Making sense of culture does not include a single reference among over 230 to the work of Stuart Hall. A kind of intellectual exorcism of the very existence of Patterson's fellow Jamaican-born intellectual that I thought was quite staggering. In other words, in the very same year that Hall passed away, as eulogies to Hall to Hall's singular contribution to the critical sociological study of culture were widespread, both within academia and further afield. The once a decade summation of the key sociological works and ideas on culture, written by one of Harvard's sociology department's most renowned thinkers, simply refused to acknowledge the existence of Hall and culture studies as a field relevant to the study of culture. It was not so much that the review found weaknesses in Hall's form of conjunctural sociology or intellectual deficiencies in the myriad researchers who, since the 1970s, have produced new theories and insights into the complexities of culture making. Rather, Patterson, and no doubt the reviewers who signed off in his article, simply chose to ignore this entire body of work. As an aside in Patterson's acknowledgements, he thanks Louis Coquant and his Harvard colleague Stephen Pinker for their comments on an early draft of the article. It is difficult to think of a public intellectual whose work is more antithetical to sociological thinking and has contributed nothing of merit to our understandings of culture than the ideas and the words of the evolutionary psychologist Stephen Pinker, but that's for another time. Instead, Patterson posited a neo-Parsonian framework premised upon measuring and conceptualizing values and norms with a nod towards behavioral psychology and cognitive science as the future for cultural analysis. Making sense of culture signals its intent with an epigraph from the anthropologist Marshall Salins from his short book, Waiting for Foucault Still, that says, quote, power, power everywhere, and how the signs do shrink, power, power everywhere, and nothing else to think. There are more references to power in the epigraph than there are in the entire article. The word power appears about five times in Making Sense of Culture, whereas the word values appears 70 times. The epigraph, of course, is meant to signal not just a dismissal of Foucault's allegedly capricious theory of power, 
but by extension, the irrelevance of post-structuralism in particular and critical social theory in general. But it also implies that power as a concept is largely irrelevant to the study of culture. Similarly, Patterson has little to say about the state. In the article, Patterson chides the sociological study of culture for what he calls, quote, sweeping dismissals and dogmatic overreactions to the errors or biases of previous traditions of scholarship, end quote, before going on in the very next paragraph to doing precisely that himself. Patterson bemoans the fact that sociologists apparently can no longer make causal claims or comparative generalizations about culture and its effects for fear of being called a racist or an essentialist because of what he describes as, quote, the oversensitivity to identity politics. He stops just short of invoking the alt-right charge of snowflakes, but you get what Patterson is driving at. For Patterson, there are two key interconnected processes that define culture. First, culture is, dynamically, is a dynamically stable process of collectively made, although unevenly shared knowledge about the world. Second, pragmatic process constitutes the other component of culture. Patterson argues for a pragmatically derived substructure of practical knowledge, which appears to be a fancy and rather convoluted way of talking about behavior. And what is at the core of cultural knowledge shaping and influencing what Patterson calls knowledge activation and the cultural pragmatics of behavior? What, in other words, is at the heart of the sociological project? Norms and values. Ah, the sociology of culture reduced the study of normative behavior and the values that shape what we do. Hello, Talcott Parsons. We thought you had long since been buried, relegated to the unread sections of old sociology textbooks, the unanswered questions on first year sociological theory exams, and your work hidden in the footnotes of rational action theory papers. But no, here you are again, making a return, raising your head, being resurrected by Harvard University's leading cultural sociologist. The rest of Patterson's article is spent carefully fleshing out the inner dynamics of both cultural knowledge and cultural pragmatics before returning to the centrality of values in motivating people's goals, what we'd like to do, and the importance of norms as shared values that both prescribe and proscribe behavior. It is acknowledged, of course, that the pragmatics of culture reflect power and status differences between individuals and affirm social identities, but these questions are relegated to minor concerns compared to mapping how cultural knowledge, norms, and values guide action. Patterson concludes by claiming that his approach to the study of culture is truly interdisciplinary and lambasts what he calls, quote, the conventional orthodoxies, one-sided agendas, and intellectually paralyzing post-what-not fads of recent decades that have bedeviled the subject. Example number two. In 2015, I submitted a panel proposal to the American Sociological Association's annual conference with three other leading US-based sociologists of culture, Shimula Radrapa, Yoti Purai and Roderick Ferguson, the current president of the American Studies Association. The panel was entitled Honoring Stuart Hall, Sociologist Engage Hall's Legacy. Hall had not long passed and it seemed a fitting way to acknowledge his sociological legacy and his contribution to the study of culture. What was more, the theme for the forthcoming conference was culture, inequalities and social inclusion across the globe. A perfect fit for a panel on Hall one would have imagined. The panel idea was, to our surprise, rejected. When we inquired as to why, we were told that due to a large number of submissions, ours had not made the cut. We asked if there had been another, we asked if there had been other panels on hall that had been selected. We wanted ours, of course, but if another panel was deemed better, then that would have been fine. But there wasn't. When we contacted Michelle Lamont, the then ASA president-elect and therefore chair of the program committee, for a fuller explanation, we were told, quote, try to submit to your proposal to a regional meeting. In other words, in the year after his death, Stuart Hall was not deemed significant enough of a sociological figure for a panel, a single panel mind, not a plenary or number of sessions, at a conference that regularly attracts over 5,000 sociologists from across the globe on the topic of culture and inequality. Instead, Lamont implied, such a panel might work better at a smaller regional conference. To date, the ASA has never had a panel on Stuart Hall. Now, rather than being isolated examples, I believe they are in fact symptomatic of the current state of US sociology, and that especially amongst its key figures, who write broadly in the area of culture, 
there was a commitment either to a near Parsonian understanding of culture as meaning making, framed as the socialization into norms and mores, pattern forms of behavior and value consensus, or a depoliticized and profoundly abstract interest in boundary making with a side interest in questions of recognition and stratification. I would argue that mainstream US-based sociologists of culture define the object and field of study in this way, not because it makes sense, to borrow Patterson's title, but because it makes culture measurable within the standard methodologies of the discipline and able to fit within pre-existing frameworks. Frameworks that are deemed to be appropriately scientific and therefore not political. Related, American sociologists of culture rarely engage the work of cultural theorists outside of the US Academy unless they are called Pierre Bourdieu. Tying the social of culture to a revamped neo-Parsonian agenda simply ensures that the field, at least in the US, becomes politically irrelevant and intellectually redundant. Again, to return to making sense of culture, Patterson criticizes sociologists for what he calls, quote, the untenable ditching with the bathwater of the Parsonian past of foundational concepts such as values and norms that strike most scholars in other disciplines as simply preposterous. If you think Patterson is alone in his desire to bathe in an altepid sociological waters of Parsons, Omar Lozado, arguably one of the most prolific writers on culture within US sociology and presently co-editor of American Sociological Review, arguably the most important journal in American sociology, recently made the following extraordinary claim. Quote, contemporary cultural theory is in its essential aspects an offshoot of cultural functionalism. Let me just repeat that line in case you weren't listening carefully or just fell off your chair in disbelief. Quote, contemporary cultural theory is, in its essential aspects, an offshoot of cultural functionalism. There you were thinking that your interest in cultural theory was an extension of your reading of Foucault and post-structuralism, or via your engagement with the deconstructionist theories of Judith Butler, or perhaps the critical theory, say, of Walter Benjamin, or latterly Theodore Adorno, or the Afro-pessimism of a Fred Moton, or a theory of culture shaped by the Marxism of Raymond Williams or E.P. Thompson, or you thought that you were working in the black radical tradition of Cedric Robertson and E.B. Du Bois, or you were a subaltern theorist working with Gartry Spivak and Jack Derrida, or an inter intersectional black feminist approach indebted to, to Patricia Collins' Angela Davis. But no, you're really working in the tradition of Parsons. It is truly, it is truly believed in, in, within this paradigm that all contemporary cultural theory is, in essence, an offshoot of cultural functionalism. Although, to be fair to Lazardo, if you add, as practiced by US sociologists of culture, the line comes close to being true. Somewhere Stuart Hall quietly laughs and C. Wright Mills sighs. Now I was thinking of Mills yesterday when uh, Michaela Benson um, powerfully outlined the purpose of this important conference and urged us to think about the different ways to reimagine the sociological. In doing so, she drew a contrast between sociology as a discipline committed to defending its methods and ways of knowing the world versus the sociological as a broader intellectual and in some ways political project. In urging us to think outside the disciplinary logics of sociology, to be creative, to, to imagine a different type of sociology, she reminded us that, that sociology doesn't have a monopoly on the sociological. And in the fuller version of this, I actually trace a relationship between C. White Mills and Stuart Hall on this point, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that um, perhaps for the, for the Q&A. Um, so one dramatic example of this move away from the critical tradition of sociology as espoused by Mills and, and its fear of cultural studies is the fact that mainstream American sociology long ago, and with a few notable exceptions, effectively stopped using the concept of class. It has largely been displaced by the notion of social economic status, or SES, as my American colleagues and grad students like to say. A problem occurs, however, when SES status is seen purely as a continuum the point at which lines are drawn to differentiate groups becomes arbitrary, especially so with interval variables. What gets included and excluded from the index itself is often a subjective judgment, and the relative power of different, often adversarial groups vis-a-vis -vis each other is elided. The underlying conditions of capitalism, the political struggles that result and in a sense produce class and questions of class consciousness, the entangling of history of sociology, as Satnam Verdi put it yesterday during his keynote, tend to get written out of the conceptual schema of analyses reliant upon an SES framework. What could be more devastating for discipline's contemporary relevance in this particular historical conjuncture to have largely ignored meaningful class analysis? 
Similarly, there's both a refusal to acknowledge the existence of racism as a structuring feature of American life within much of this work, and related, either a dismissal or complete lack of awareness of the contributions of black studies scholars to questions of culture, identity, and meaning. Thus, Andreas Wimmer, in his book, Ethnic Boundary Making, Institutions, Power, Networks, asserts that racism doesn't exist in any meaningful way in the United States or in Switzerland. Wimmer sets out to rebut the claims of scholars of race who, he alleges, see racism lurking in every social structure, in every social interaction, and in every social identity. He suggests critical race theorists simply assume racism to be an important and a significant aspect of social relations and identities, rather than proving their case with rigorous, empirical, and verifiable evidence. Race scholars apparently merely assert the importance of race and racism based on a political and not scholarly agenda. Wimmer concedes that whilst racism was historically a structuring feature of countries like the United States and might still be significant in small ways today in certain delimited areas, and also maybe in societies like Britain that had a colonial past, for Wimmer, there is little evidence to suggest that other countries, and especially predominantly white European countries such as Switzerland, show any meaningful forms of anti-black racism or Islamophobia. Is that xenophobia may be a factor, but not racism. And anyone who suggests otherwise is important American racialization theory into societies where the theory does not hold. Instead, Wimmer posits that we need to, quote, de-ethnicize our research designs. Wimmer proposes a set of general theoretical propositions that, that can identify the real underlying mechanisms that facilitate boundary making. Wimmer identifies, quote, non-ethnic units of observation that should replace race scholars' fixation with questions of race and ethnicity. The four areas that we're now going to be allowed to, to use and to study, uh, for those still interested in ethnicity, should, should thenceforth organize their now ethnically cleansed research projects around individuals, institutional fields, classes, and localities. Louis Coquant, who himself argues that racism is not a useful concept because it is used too widely, describes the book, Wimmer's book, as, quote, one of the most exciting books I've read in any social science in two decades. Similarly, Michelle Lamont claims that ethnic boundary making has, quote, the makings of a classic, maybe in a sense that Charles Murray's books are often called classic. <laughs> Wimmer's arguments, and others like him, for ethnic boundary making is merely symptomatic, not exceptional, are predominantly motivated by two linked impulses. First, there is an attempt by mainstream social science and US-based forms of sociological inquiry to deny the foundational and constitutive role of racism and white supremacy in the founding discourses and institutions of Western colonial democracies, and also to avoid considering how racism impacted and shaped sociology's founding precepts. These sociologists, often white European followers of Pierre Bourdieu, but not exclusively so, are ideologically committed to the idea of not just the declining significance of race, but to the declining relevancy of racism as an ideology, as a practice of domination, and even as a concept. And second, these sociologists are often further committed to countering what they perceive to be a threat to their intellectual disciplinary turf. That is sociology's proprietary claim to be able to decide how society should be defined, understood, and analyzed. This, th this threat, in their eyes, comes from cultural studies. Thus, the move to dismiss, their, their move to dismiss cultural studies work as politicized and lacking in scholarly merit, on the one hand, and simply by stealing the ideas produced by cultural studies theorists and then claiming it as their own on the other. So for time's sake, as I'm given the signal, I'll conclude here. Um, and perhaps to end on a bit more of an optimistic note. I wonder if we can be a bit bolder, less defensive, more radical, braver even. Whilst I understand the positioning of locating our conversations, quote, from the edge, I also wonder if that reproduces a certain self-fulfilling marginality, that it concedes too much. I wonder if instead we might reverse things a little to move from the margins to the center, or rather to make the more assertive claim that cultural studies is actually the space where the, where the sociological imagination, fully developed, engaged and engaging, critical and politically relevant, is most apparent. And it is the stupefying, narrowly empiricist, and conceptually moribund so-called mainstream contemporary US sociology, and especially that of the US sociology of culture that is on the edges of importance and usefulness. 
And of course, it's not even a science anyway. As Stuart Hall once remarked, quote, although sociology thinks it's a predictive science, it doesn't predict anything very much very well. So here's a cultural studies prediction. Sociology may be dying, but the sociological, sociological project is alive and well in precisely those spaces where it is most disavowed. Thank you. I thank you for the introduction. Emma, thank you for putting this panel together. Thanks to the organizers who put together this brilliant conference. Really thrilled to be here. Um, I, uh, I'm going to tackle, I feel like I'm going to tackle this question head on. Why does, cultural why does cultural studies matter for sociology, right? Why does cultural studies matter for sociology? And I'm going to think in particular about the study of popular culture and cultural representations. I say this as someone with a PhD in sociology, but who finds himself in a media department. Uh, my interests are in race and racism and the media as a space where discourses of race circulate, reinforcing, but at times challenging, hegemonic ideas around race and difference. Um, from sociology, I learned how race shapes social formations and how even as a social construct, it produces very real material and, dare I say, devastating effects. But moreover, I was a product very much of the cultural turn in sociology that happened in the 1990s, in particular, the work of Stuart Hall, um, and his famous essay, New Ethnicities, and along, along with his other writings on cultural identity, that drew attention to, um, that drew attention, that drew the attention of sociologists to the politics of representation. All of a sudden, popular culture, whether music, videos, films, television, sitcoms, novels, rap lyrics, not only became legitimate objects of study, but actually understood as the key objects of study in order to ascertain how our understandings of race and cultural difference are constructed. And I think the best work in this vein looks at how race intersects with other axes of identity, such as gender, sexuality, class, and so on. This was especially, I'd say, important intervention in, socio in sociology of race, which was still dominated by race relations orthodoxy and not attuned, I argue, to the cultural forms of racism. This was the moment of cultural studies, and I think it gave socio sociology a much needed shake-up. But this critical cultural studies approach has stalled in recent times. So in, this, in the next few minutes, I want to briefly consider why that might be the case before making a case for what sociology can learn from cultural studies, particularly for those of us engaged in sociologies of race and racism. So in sociology today, I believe popular culture is still a taboo subject, especially in race-critical scholarship. While there has been brilliant work on race and the everyday, and everyday culture, the study of media, culture, and, 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 and representation is, I believe, a very peripheral area of study in sociology of race and racism, race and ethnic studies. And I think, incidentally, this race and, the study of race and racism is a marginal area in media and communications. In recent times, sociological forays into media and cultural representation mostly come from those researching Islamophobia in the press, analyzing the various ways in which Muslims and Islam have been represented in news stories. And while there is some interest in popular culture and representation, and actually having Ben here you know, is a reminder that I think some of the most interesting work in that field is happening in sociology of sport, not least Ben's work, but Arti Rani and Dan Birdsey. Um, but nonetheless, I argue that in sociolo sociological studies of race in popular media appear less frequently than one might imagine. And that's actually quite weird, I'd say, because when we consider Stuart Hall, perhaps the most influential scholar of race in British, British sociolo sociology, and his assertion in his 1981 essay, Deconstructing the Popular, that popular, popular culture matters, even though he actually goes on to say that he personally doesn't give a damn about it. That's an exact quote. Um, for a time, Stuart Hall brought question of Britain's troubled relationship with race, with multicultural, with its own post-coloniality post to the forefront of sociology. And the media was, the fre was frequently the object of his analysis. Yet in recent times, this approach to studying race and racism has fallen out of favor, and the study of media texts, cultural representation, and popular culture has returned to the marginal status and sociologies of race and racism. I think I've labored that point now, but maybe I'll move on. But why does it remain such a taboo subject for sociologists? Well, I think we're still experiencing a hangover from the Frankfurt School, where we're still suspicious of the ideological function of the cultural industries, which is quite ironic, because as far as I'm concerned, sociologists watch more TV than anyone else I know. <laughs> Um, I know that sounds anecdotal, but it's actual social fact. Um, 
it's also the case that I think the you know, kind of studying popular culture is seen as a distraction, distraction from real important political work when continued economic exploitation and racial violence on the streets, um, Grenfell and people actually dying. Um, I'm always reminded of Stuart Hall where he, he's exasperated what in the hell is the point, Matt, what is the point of cultural studies? He's, re he's referring to the AIDS epidemic actually and the people dying through that. Um, and I can, I can, yeah, that, so, so there's this idea that popular culture, why are you studying television when race and racism continues to be a matter of life and death? Um, Claire Alexander, whose work I really admire, in a keynote speech that she gave at the annual conference of South Asian popular culture, questions what she disparagingly calls culturalist approaches to race and ethnicity and the fascination with issues of, quote, cultural commodification, production and consumption at the expense of people and the structures of power and material context within which culture takes place. She adds, and this is a really interesting quote, whether in the current climate this is a luxury that we can afford. I certainly, as I say, I'm a fan of Claire's work, and I certainly sympathise with that argument, for, but for me, the best um, work, studies of cultural commodification, of cultural production and consumption, have always retained that question of power, has always situated it within the material. One of, I, you know, I'm kind of, so far I've kind of stressed how I think the study of popular culture has been marginal in the study of race, but actually that's not so much the case I find in feminist studies, where... Um, where I think in that scholarship we see that linkaging between popular culture, between government policy, between the everyday um, happening, you know, it's constantly. So I'm thinking of, for instance, Sarah De Benedictus, Kim Allen and Tracy Jensen's new work on like poverty porn as a television format and how the welfare state is being imagined and how this is shaping government policy to, to welfare. I'm thinking of Imogen Tyler's work on the construction of the Chav Mum and the objectification of working class women in the media and in politics. More squarely in the black feminist tradition, I'm thinking of Francesca Solban's recent article on black women and the engagement of YouTube, which offers a kind of radical approach to popular culture that I'm certainly learning from. Feminist, feminist studies, I think, continues the foundational work of cultural studies in, A, taking seriously the everyday, but also taking seriously the popular culture of some of the most denigrated, demonised and maligned um, members of society. What I personally take from feminist studies is how media, culture and political rhetoric work together, feed into each other, and it's the means through which the state creates a consensus through which it can act its authoritarian policies, which of course was the key intervention of police in the crisis. And you should also check out, if you haven't already, the recent book, Go Home, The Politics of Immigration Controversies, um, co-authored by Emma Jackson amongst many others. Um, in Angela McRobbie's Aftermath of Feminism, she uses the phrase space of attention to illuminate the politics of the young girl, the figure of the young girl in the context of gendered modernity, drawing from commercial, political, and media discourses. And it's exactly that kind of approach that I think we need to adopt here. Popular culture as an important space of attention alongside government policy, alongside the everyday, alongside the legal system. We need to focus on those things in order to understand the dynamics of the current, current conjuncture. So to many of you, that seems like good, like common sense, or rather good sense, to use Gramsci's vernacular. Yet to reiterate, I feel the sociologists of race tend to ignore these questions of media and culture. And to illustrate why I think this is a problematic assertion, I want to briefly explore what a cultural studies interest in cultural commodification, to use Claire Alexander's terminology, tell us about the current conjuncture and racialized modernity, um, or indeed racial neoliberalism. Firstly, I want to work with Paul, um, Stuart Hall's notion of popular culture being a site of struggle, where hege the battle, battle for hegemony is being fought. Crucially for Hall, there's no outright winner in this battle. I always think of it as, you know, like that kid's game, Marble Run, where you kind of lift up the sides, you know what I'm talking about? Um, and yeah, and I think that's what essentially popular culture is, albeit constantly in motion. So on the one and and keeping that in mind, a cultural studies approach to race with a focus on cultural commodification reveals a paradox. There's a paradox in the governance of race. Because on that, and this actually echoes Satnam's talk from yesterday. Because on the one hand, we see the popular press continuing to demonize Muslims and migrants, and young black youth are never far away in their role as the urban folk devil, such as the latest moral panic over drill music. Um, and I think sociologists are really good on this stuff. But on the other hand, popular culture features more people, people of color than at any point of history. 
Um, and while we still see stereotyping, whitewashing, airbrushing, we also see a lot more opportunities for people of colour when they're not defined by their race. And, you know, if you, I don't know if anyone still does this, flicks through TV um, channels and remote control. That's a very 80s image for some reason. But certainly, if you kind of, like, on a Tuesday night at between 8 and 10, if you flick through the channels, you will see people of colour and often not being stereotyped in really reductive ways. The paradox at the heart of cultural commodification contains, I argue, both enabling and constraining dynamics. If we start off with the enabling features of cultural commodification in the context of contemporary popular culture, um, recently I gave a talk on the cultural industries and populism, and I used the example of Grime for Corbyn as a critical moment where cult black cultural producers helped shape um, the public agenda. I argue that Grime for Corbyn helped pull the consensus leftwards. I think this is illustrated further in the coverage of the Windrush scandal and the hostile environment, which was coined precisely because it was seen as a vote winner, based on an archaic nationalism that the popular press lap up. And is now something, actually, that the government is trying to disavow or distance itself from. I mean, I think that's an incredible turnaround. Though, incidentally, I don't want to call this a victory since the government are yet to fully redress, if at all, the racial, social, racial and social injustices of Windrush and Grenfell. Um, another example, though, of the enabling features of popular culture is once there was, where once there was invisibility, right now we're seeing a hyper-visibility of race in the media, especially in popular culture. Um, this has always been the case in reality TV, which has always relied on having a variety of social types. But even in drama and comedy, we're seeing more roles for people of colour. The likes of Lenny Henry, Idris Elba, Riz Ahmed are speaking in Parliament, making the cultural industries face up to its hideous whiteness. Um, studios, television networks and actors know the negative effects or indeed bad press that can follow having a lack of diversity in your production. So this would stress again that hegemony would suggest maybe that hegemony is being pulled leftwards or at least in more progressive directions. But if we focus on the constraining dynamics of cultural commodification, we might see more, for instance, we might see more black and brown people um, on TV and film in particular, but what, to what extent do we really learn about black and brown lives? In the, neoliberal current, in the current neoliberal conjunction, diversity has taken on a value. It's a marker of lifestyles, of brands, of market niches. This is very much in contrast to the softly anti-racist policies of multiculturalism from the 80s. In other words, this approach to diversity depends on the commodification of race, where racial identity becomes a value to be extracted, sometimes by the person of colour in question, but mostly by white dominant culture. I'm thinking of, um, do you remember that Tesco's ad from Christmas, Everyone's Welcome? And it caused controversy because there was a, it had families, you know, all kind of celebrating Christmas, a whole diversity of families, and they had a Muslim family on it, which caused, you know, upset some people. But what was really interesting, it was like literally, it was how many hijabs can we fit on this screen? It was like, really, I found it a little bit over the top. But you see a hyper-visibility of race, but an invisibility of any discussion of racism or structural discrimination. Moreover, these media representations paint society as what Joe Little has recently called a post-racial meritocracy. Herman Gray, who I'm a big hero of, uh, I'm a big hero. <laughs> if you're watching this, Herman. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, has, has argued that we've gone from anti-racist struggles to anti-racial ones. Recently, I've made a habit of describing the media's approach to diversity as managing the demands of minorities while keeping racial hierarchies intact. I want to add to that formulation now and say that the approach, media's approach to diversity is a way of managing the demands of minorities, keeping the status quo intact, while simultaneously extracting surplus value. It's a win-win for empire, racial subjugation and economic exploitation, once again, all bound up in each other. This paradox or contradiction, I argue, is the defining feature of racial neoliberalism, but it cannot be fully understood, and this is my point, without a consideration of the politics of popular culture. This is what a cultural study approach can bring to the sociology of race, not least sociology more generally. So to conclude, I've explored why cultural... <laughs> Sorry, just thinking of that Herman Gray. <laughs> <laughs> I've explored why cultural studies matters for race, but let's not forget why sociology matters for cultural studies. Cultural studies fixation on the text is problematic. Remember for Hall, the politics of race, um, politics of representation was so much more complex than simply talking about biased or truthful, positive or negative, authentic or stereotypical. Um, has, what I've learned from Stuart Hall is that cultural representation can simultaneously hold both reactionary and radical elements. Um, so sociology is vital for contextualizing the textual. 
It means how, how a text comes together with other texts to form discursive formations that shape our ideas around gender, race, sexuality, disability, class, and so on. It means looking at culture making in its natural habitat, whether that's the city, and there's some amazing work done by sociologists on this, um, or the formal institutions of the cultural industries, which is my own interest. The media, alongside government policy, alongside the legal and education system, together create a hegemonic field of meaning which determines the everyday. And I know some people will get freaked out by that word, but I purposely work with Raymond Williams' notion of determination as setting limits, exerting pressures, which crucially allows for resistance and contestation. Um, Drawing from cultural studies, I believe sociologists interested in race and media need to centralise the question of media culture alongside their core concerns, areas of concern in order to get a keener sense of how racialised discourses circulate and help sustain and also potentially disrupt racial hierarchies. This entails recognising how media permeates the macro and micro dimensions of social life, from how media discourses communicate but also shape government policy, to how everyday encounters with difference are increasingly media mediated, not least through social media. But fundamentally, it also entails recognizing that popular culture, far from trivial, is a site of struggle, where hegemony, where hegemony is being fought over. For Hall, and this kind of sounds like wishful thinking, but I think it's a good place to finish, he says that popular culture is one of the few places where socialism might be constituted. This is why culture matters, and why I quite frankly think we should all give a damn about it. Thank you. <laughs>